refugees that were sent to Afghanistan. I was so upset that I cannot tell you how, how disgusted, how upset, how, how angry I really was about what happened. I could not believe that actually a, a, a neighbor of ours, a neighbor of any neighbor, especially a neighbor like Pakistan, for God's sakes, you know, they can do something like that to Afghanistan at the time of, it's not like Pakistan does not know where Afghanistan is. They have a hand in bringing everything that it is happening in Afghanistan. They all have a hand and they had a hand from the beginning. So, you know, they know it. And here we are, you know, with the Taliban, with the way our economy is, with the way the whole situation is, with the way, and then sending hundreds and thousands of refugees that were legally supposed to be in Pakistan, most of them. And they live their lives there. And they have their children that have gone to school. And they have a life there. And they made a life for themselves. And, and, and send them back to Afghanistan. And, and, as, and as you all know, that Afghanistan was not ready because the United Nations was not ready to, to, you know, to help these refugees the way they were supposed to, to kind of re reestablish them in Afghanistan and give them the, the assistance that they needed. And then having a, you know, a government in Afghanistan that although, I mean, um, maybe they are trying, maybe they are not, because that's also one of those things that is not very clear to us. That the, uh, you know, for, for reestablishing them and reestablishing them in, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, but I don't know whether they really care deeply. Or not. I don't think, I don't think so. So right now we are kind of living in a world, including my country, that the, not the people of the country, because this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to separate the, the beings, the, the, the people of each country, like the Pakistanis from the Pakistan government, like Hindustanis from the Hindustan government, like the US, the Americans, like the, from the American government. I, I'm trying to separate all of this, honestly, because if I don't separate, if I don't in my mind, then this world is not, is not that place for any human being to be living in anymore. We are in a very bad place. Things are happening in such a way that, that you know, we are going towards a complete chaos and we are going, and we are giving ourselves to this chaos and we are letting it take over our lives. And, and that is, you know, with what's happening in Gaza, for example. And that, that is horrible, it's, 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 it's terrible. And the whole thing, the way it happened in Afghanistan, all. Kind of a, a reaction from the Pakistani people. That's why I love Asma Jahangir's gatherings, because that's what actually brings these questions to, to its point and brings it to the people and says, you know, this is the kind of a questions that the people of Pakistan should be asking the government. You know, that what, what is going on? Why are we doing this? But, and I'm glad that I heard that from all of you. Uh, I don't think you have any answer for us, and I don't believe that we have any answer to give. But um, here we are. You know the situation much better. There is no point for me to give you numbers. There is no point for me to tell you how miserable everybody is. There is no point to tell for me to tell you how how terrible the whole situation is in this country now, with all of the refugees coming and how their lives are and how how they are trying to cope and they really cannot and it's really hard and they are doing their best and oh my gosh, it's like. Um, I don't know how many of them I'm supposed to be talking about it and how much, and if I give you numbers, will that make it any different? To me, it doesn't because it's a, it's hundreds and thousands of, of, of humanity and human beings going through absolutely a miserable time because some governments, they decide to do what they decide to do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mehbooba Jan, thank you very much. That was a really heartfelt appeal to the Pakistani people to support 
the presence of Afghan refugees uh, in Pakistan. I'm going to ask now the deputy representative of uh, UN, U, UNHCR, uh, the Human Rights uh, um, Commission, to come to speak, please. For, and I'd like to remind everyone that you only have five minutes each. We have a long list of speakers, and we want to get everyone in. So UN, UNHCR representative. I'm honored to be on this panel. Um, in a word, uh, in a word where millions of people are fueled from their, are displaced from their houses due to old and new conflicts, and where refugees are being labeled as burden, as terrorist, where political uh, solution are in short supply, we need voices and I appreciate and acknowledge and um, pay tribute to all the voices who are expressing their views, who are speaking out for refugee rights across the world. Um, I would like to appreciate and acknowledge the people and government of Pakistan for hosting Afghan refugees for the last 40 years. And despite the fact that Pakistan is not signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention and its protocol, still the people and the government, they have, they have supported Afghan refugees. And there are challenges, their own economic challenges, their own issues in Pakistan, but still. And we are appealing, we are appealing to the government to continue to provide this support to Afghan refugees who are living here we have basically different types of, uh, different categories of Afghan refugees in Pakistan. The one who are holding proof of registration cards, POR cards, who are well, like, there are 1.3 million Afghan refugees, they are living here. And then there are some 800,000 people who are holding Afghan citizen cards in Pakistan. And they were registered in 2017. In 2021, um, after the developments in Afghanistan, according to government estimates, some 600,000 people came to Pakistan and they, they are living here. And last, uh, last, last, uh, last week, uh, last month, the government uh, initiated this plan to, uh, to ask Afghan refugees and the asylum seeker to go back to Afghanistan. And we actually opposed that plan. And we actually expressed our concern that nobody leave their house by choice. They are compelled, they are living here, and we need to continue to provide our support to these people because they need our su support. And we need to see these people through a humanitarian lens rather than a political lens because they are the victim of war and they are not the perpetrators. They are here, they, have, they, are, they are seeking asylum in Pakistan. So that's why we have proposed, we have been asking the government to, to come up with a plan, with a comprehensive plan to register these asylum seekers in Pakistan. But the government is not supportive of accepting new people in Pakistan. And we have provided, thank you. So we have asked the government that we are ready to support, uh, to provide technical support to uh, provide uh, financial support to the government so that we can register these people. And uh, because the situation in Afghanistan is not satisfactory, um, it is imperative. Uh, the state has the right to regulate its laws, to implement its laws, to regulate its border. But keeping in view the situation in Afghanistan, uh, the humanitarian human rights situation in Afghanistan, particularly related to girls and women, they cannot, these people cannot go back to Afghanistan. We should not be sending these people, um, if their lives are at, or freedom are, ex, are at stake in Afghanistan or at risk in Afghanistan. So we are asking the government, we are appealing to the government to, 
continue to provide support to these people. Um, otherwise, it would be uh, it would be very risky for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask now uh, Patricia Grossman, who's online behind me. I hope uh, she's uh, Associated Director Human Rights Watch in New York. She's been concerned with the Afghan situation ever since I can remember, uh, which is at least 40 years ago, uh, at the time of the Soviet invasion. Um, she's been a stalwart a defender of Afghan people's rights, and we are very fortunate to have her. Patricia, go ahead. You've got five minutes. Thank you very much, Hamid, and it's very nice to be um, here today. Thanks for the invitation. It's good to be connected with old friends. Um, I'd like to start with just saying that, um, you know, this isn't the first time we've seen this happen to Afghan refugees in Pakistan. Um, it's a, a cyclical thing. And in 2016, we saw almost the same numbers we're seeing now. Uh, people coerced uh, to leave for, for Afghanistan uh, by many of the same means we're seeing now. Now it looks like the numbers may go much higher. And I'm very careful here not to say returned to Afghanistan, because in many cases, well, that's true for some, many cases of the people being forced to leave include Afghans that were actually born in Pakistan, who've lived their entire lives there, who built their lives there, and are now being coerced to leave through a whole range of abuses, uh, detention, seizures of the property, uh, beatings and so on. And if you look at the um, the figures that come out from the updates from IOM and UNHCR, something like 90% report that fear of detention is the reason they're leaving. And of course, once that begins, then others feel the same fear and you end up with this uh, an exodus of people who are then leaving for, um, as Abubakar Saraj pointed out, in a country where the economic situation is already in crisis. Um, people arriving and are, are not able to take much money or property with them because of the, the way the Pakistani authorities prevent that. And so then arrive destitute and uh, in, a, in a situation where already there aren't jobs, there aren't ways for people to make much of an income going to villages where maybe they originated many, many years ago, but have very little. So we're adding to an already very um, catastrophic humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. Not to mention, of course, it's already been said, uh, those le leaving for Afghanistan include families with girls who may have been in school in Pakistan who now will not have that opportunity in Afghanistan, women who may have been working or in university who not, will not be able to do so in Afghanistan. So it is really a, an unprecedented crisis. But I also want to point out that one of the reasons it's very difficult um, within the international community to put pressure on Pakistan in this regard is that other countries have also behaved just abysmally toward Afghan refugees. Many promises were made in Europe, in the, in the US, to take in Afghans, particularly, of course, after the Taliban takeover. And we've seen really that those promises have not been met. I could point particularly to, say, Germany. At one point, we're saying they would be bringing in a thousand Afghans a month. They've fallen so far short of that, and, and including many Afghans who are particularly at risk, journalists, human rights defenders, and the rest, who end up now, I know many, still stuck either in Afghanistan or in Pakistan in desperate circumstances and unable to find any safe pathways to resettlement elsewhere, despite all the promises by donor countries who supported all these efforts in Afghanistan over the last 22 years. Um, so I, I'm going to keep it very short because I'm aware of the five minutes, but I would say that you know, we have a complex humanitarian crisis now, both the abuses on the Pakistani border side, the failure of other countries to respond adequately, and of course the situation in Afghanistan with the Taliban repression, making many of these people coming to Afghanistan now, returnees and others, at risk. Um, and also at risk because of a very dire economic situation. So it really it needs an urgent response that we're not yet seeing from, from countries, concerned countries who should be stepping up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Patricia. much, Patricia. That was uh, very well put. It, it's really sad that wherever we look on this issue of Afghan refugees, it's a story of, of pity and um, uh, in, in incredible frustration and anger 
at the fact that after so many years, the international community has virtually um, abandoned Af uh, Afghan civil population uh, and is not being able to fulfill their needs. We do understand that there are other uh, phenomenon going on, <coughs> Gaza, Ukraine, and uh, Sudan, and many other places. But this, this does deserve more, perhaps from the more wealthy part of the globe. Uh, I'm going to ask next uh, an activist, a Hazara activist, Fatma Asif. Atif, I'm going to ask her to come up to the stage, if she can. Or you, or you want to speak? From, come up here, I think. If you come up on the stage, people at the back will be able to hear you. At the moment, people are not hearing um, speakers at the back of the room. Let, let me just uh, uh, say to you that Hazaras have been the most persecuted, the most deeply affected population, both in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. Uh, we are deeply ashamed at the way the Hazaras have been treated in Pakistan uh, and, and in Afghanistan. And they are the number one ethnic group which needs to uh, find a solution, which the world needs to find a solution and get them out of this present plight. Please, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, appreciate and thank Asma Jahangir Conference, who gathered such marvelous panelists over here to talk on the very important issue. Just talking about the issue that Afghan refugees, when they started coming to Pakistan, this issue was the one topic which was always ignored by the government and by the political parties. Not, some of them were uh, like-minded who wanted to work just like Pakistan People's Party, but other parties, all of them were in a state of ignorance. And later on, we saw that the expulsion of Afghan refugees showed us that uh, this issue was taken over. Of course, this was in the hand of security establishment, but this was taken over very roughly. And during the era of interim government, the Afghans were forced to go back to their countries. Just to give you an overview that what could be the reasons that there could be many reasons. The biggest problem which hinders is that there is no law in Pakistan. Jo Afghan refugees ke masle ko dek sake. Or just Afridi Sahab ne bataya that we are not signatory of Geneva Convention. 1951, if we are a signatory, then we have to be in Pakistan, which we are not. security establishment ki willingness nahi hai. There is no willingness from security establishments. That's why there is no law. There has been some temporary policy and those policies were always not a complete policy. Those were just notifications maybe or just very temporary and responsive decisions which were made uh, by the certain governments in certain uh, time and in certain situations. Uh, just to throw back the uh, PMLN ki government in February 2017, Cabinet ne decide kiya tha ke Afghan refugees ke masle pe kanun saazi ki jayegi. Lekin wo aur masle ban gaye aur ye idea collapse kar gaya aur is pe kam nahi hua. And then Imran Khan publicly also stated ke of Pakistan me Afghan shehriyo ko Afghan Afghan refugees ko shehriyat di jayegi. Or Balke Unhone a publicly statement be the attack of Ghan, but Chejo Yahape Peda Honge, they will also be of Ghan, so Pakistani, so ye idea be Merahale collapse, he Kargia, or of Ghan refugees, Kehavales, double standards, Kehavales, Kabibunko, Jazak Nahimili. General Ziaulak Sapke Dorme, Deka Apneke, 
انصار اور مہاجرین کا ایک سلسلہ سامنے آیا اور وہاں اس وقت بھی اسی ایک پالیسی کو جو افغان اور مہاجر والا تھا کہ ہم انصار ہیں وہ مہاجر ہیں اس کو ذہن میں رکھتے ہوئے کوئی پالیسی نہیں بنائی گئی سو آئل بی کوئک کہ پوسٹ اگست 2021 کے بعد بارڈر پر بہت سارے مسائل ہوئے افغان ریفیوجیز کو یہاں آنے میں اور انہوں نے برائب دے کر اور مختلف طریقوں سے اللیگل طریقوں سے بھی وہ پاکستان میں داخل ہوئے اور اگست دوزار اکیس کے بعد وہ پاکستان میں اپنے تمام بنیادی حقوق سے محروم رہے جس میں ان کے تعلیم صحت روزگار صحت کے وسائل تک رسائی ان تمام فسیلٹیز سے بنیادی ضروریات سے وہ محروم رہے ہیں ابھی تک اس میں رول آف یونیش سیار ہمارے کولیگز یہاں پہ بیٹھے ہوئے یونیش سیار اور شارب سے اس میں بہت یہ دھائی سال سے زیادہ کا عرصہ اس میں حکومت پاکستان کا جس طرح آفریدی صاحب نے بتایا کہ حکومت پاکستان نے یونیش سیار کو منع کیا تھا کہ وہ افغان ریفیوجیز کو ریجسٹر نہ کریں بھئی اگر آپ خود ریجسٹر نہیں کر سکتے آپ کے پاس کپیسٹی نہیں ہے تو پھر آپ ایسی ریفیوجیز پہ جو کام کرنے والی انٹرنیشنل ارگنائزیشنز ہیں تو ان کو آپ یہ اختیار دے کے وہ یہ کام کریں مہاجرین اسلام آباد میں نیشنل پریس کلپ کے باہر چھے ماہ تک دھرنے پہ بیٹھے رہے اور ان کو اللیگل طریقوں سے اٹھا لیا گیا ان کو گرفتار کیا گیا اور ان کو مجبور کیا گیا کہ وہ دھرنا چھوڑ کر چلے جائیں ایک ڈائلاغ کروایا گیا کیونکہ گورنمنٹ آف پاکستان کی نو پالیسی والے سیچویشن کی وجہ سے سب پریشان تھے اور بھٹو شہید فاؤنڈیشن اور ہم والنٹیئرز نے ایک ڈائلاغ کروایا جس کے گورنمنٹ کے اور ریفیوجیز کے درمیان جس کے نتیجے میں ایک ہیومن رائٹ سٹینڈنگ کمیٹی تک یہ ایشو ہم لے کر چلے گئے ایز ای ریزلٹ ایک بل بھی مارچ 2023 میں محسن داور صاحب نے پیش کیا جو جس کو نظر انداز کیا گیا اس پہ بحث نہیں کیا گیا خواتین سپیسیفک بہت سارے مسائل ہے ریکمنڈیشنز ویری کوئک کہ پولٹیکل پارٹیز شوڈ ٹاک آن دس ویری امپورٹنٹ ایشو اور جو ایک ڈسکنیکٹ ہے اس کو ختم کیا جائے قانون سازی ہو اور فارنرز ریجسٹریشن ایکٹ کو ری ویزٹ کیا جائے یونیس سی آر اور ایسے دوسرے اداروں کو انیبل کیا جائے کہ وہ اپنا کام کریں اگر مہاجرین کو واپس بیجنے کا فیصلہ ہوتا ہے تو ان کو بقاعدہ پلاننگ کے ساتھ اور ان کو ڈگنیفائیڈ طریقے سے پلاننگ کر کے بھیجا جائے اور فرسٹ اکتوبر دوہزار تئیس کو جو فیصلہ کیا گیا ہے کہ مہاجرین کو واپس بھیجا ہے this is in human human rights violations ہے یہ افغان ریفیوجیز کے حوالے سے اور ہم اس کی مضمت کرتے ہیں اور چاہتے ہیں کہ حکومت مطالبہ کرتے ہیں کہ حکومت پاکستان اس مسئلے کو ہمدردانہ اور انسان دوستانہ طریقے سے دیکھے سوری تو ٹیک یو ٹائم It's clear what we are seeing from all the speakers is that there is no rest, uh, there is no respite for the Hazara population and for other minorities in Afghanistan at the moment um, uh, majorities include women of course children whose education has been stopped um, And this refugee crisis only adds to the, the terrible uh, hardships that Afghans have to go through. I'm going to ask now another activist, uh, the CEO of SHARP, the Society for Human Rights and Prisoners' Aid, to come up to the microphone, perhaps, and explain what they're doing um, in, in aid of the Afghan refugees. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to congratulate all the organizers of this conference. And uh, I would really appreciate uh, to add this very important session of expulsion of refugees in this conference. And uh, we are here, we are gathered here to pay homage to a star icon, Ms. Asma Jangir, who inspires us all and she was the champion of human rights, democracy, and human rights. Thank you very much. Most of the things have been already said by my colleagues, but uh, I have got only five minutes to talk about expulsion of, of, of Afghan refugees, but the history is so long. Uh, 
we have been hosting generously to Afghan refugees from last 40 years and all the government and people of Pakistan has contributed and sacrificed their resources, their places, their homes, shared everything with Afghan refugees. But uh, the things happening, developing right now is not right time and the right way to send them as enemies. I mean, if we don't sit with the international community with the sport we have been accommodating them for years it would add pressure it would not go in our ways if we like send them as uh, forcefully as we are doing and there are policies uh, which are not discussed or uh, uh, like not properly planned for durable solution in this region i wish we could have discussed all these things with the international colleagues and the international community, uh, UN uh, uh, systems, A proper planning could have been done. But as Afridi Saab mentioned, we have a, a couple of waves of Afghan refugees who came to Pakistan. The first wave was in uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s. And the second was in 90s and third was in 20. Uh, 2000 and the last wave after regime change in Kabul was in 2021 where nearly 700,000 Afghans came to Pakistan but unfortunately we don't had any policy how to accommodate them provide them legal assistance registration or anything and they have been like waiting for their fate and uh, this also uh, uh, put a question mark on international community because most of the people who came in Pakistan in last uh, 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 wave in 2021, they came here on the promises of international community, many high commissions, embassies or international organization with whom these Afghans were working. And many of them were women, uh, civil society actors, uh, uh, sportswomen and other colleagues. But you know, Pakistan doesn't have any law. And still we are accommodating millions of Afghan refugees. But this is, this is the right time to sit with the international community and place some recommendations and suggestions to create flexible re visa regime to speed up their cases which are delayed uh, in other countries. They are waiting for resettlement. Unfortunately, here in, uh, if you see that Afghan's fate have been not only here in this region, they have never been given that uh, opportunity. They can only repatriate. They are very limited of re resettlement for them. There is no integration as we don't have any law. And their issues are escalating there. And uh, especially women and children are suffering a lot. There is no job opportunities here for them. And uh, we are working in Afghanistan as well. And there is uh, no infrastructure, proper infrastructure, schools, hospitals things like that in Afghanistan. If we are uh, sending them like that forcefully, that might create statelessness for the people who, because they don't have ID card or registration or registration here, and when they go back, they might not have those documentation and passports or whatever. The, uh, so we really need, it's very sensitive matter, and uh, we are sharing border with Afghanistan, and we have to live with them uh, next, like, how many years. That's why we should not send them as enemies. We should send them as friends and we should invest resources. Put some cause nearly 64% of the people, uh, uh, young people in Afghan communities, we need to add resources, bring more resource allocation for skill development. So if they go back to Afghanistan, if they stay here or travel to any other country, they must have some sk skills to contribute and we have been lacking that we couldn't get any uh, uh, benefits from these communities because they have rich culture, rich history and they have been positively contributing in Pakistan's economy. So if we don't take consideration or think wisely at this time, they might be like going in the hands of other people who can use them in wrongful activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, sir. I, I much appreciate your very practical suggestion, and I hope the diplomats and the UN organizations that are here today will consider these very practical um, uh, efforts to try and 
improve the situation. We, we now come to one of our key speakers, uh, Ms. Christine Chung, who's from the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights of the United Nations. If you'd come up to the platform. It's very important that we get the support of um, the Human Rights Commission uh, for human rights. And I, and I know the work that Christine Chung has done in order to improve the chances of that happening. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to, for the organizers of my favorite conference in Pakistan, the Asma Jahangir uh, Conference. I look forward to this every year. Um, I'm here to speak um, about Pakistan's international human rights law obligations. Pakistan is state party to seven core international human rights treaties. That means that Pakistan voluntarily ratified these conventions um, and as part of that it accepted legally binding obligations. Part of the process is to report um, on progress of implementing these treaties and receiving recommendations um, on the implementation progress from the expert committees that are attached to each of these um, human rights treaties. Six of the committees recently reviewed Pakistan and Geneva. Five of these committees explicitly speak to the situation of Afghan refugees and migrants in Pakistan. The CEDAW committee, the committee that oversees the implementation um, of the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, spoke more generally about the situation of refugees in Pakistan. So for those of you um, who are not uh, using this for your uh, bedtime reading material, I'm just going to remind you of what the um, committees have said about Pakistan's um, obligations under international human rights law regarding um, Afghans. And so um, one example was the Committee on the Rights of the Child um, in 2016 made this observation about Pakistan. Although the committee appreciates that the state party continues to host a large number of refugees, especially from Afghanistan, it regrets the lack of a legal framework for refugees and stateless persons. It also remains concerned that refugee children are often unregistered, especially those whose parents do not hold proof of registration cards and have no access to education, which forces them to join madrasas, live in harsh conditions, and are subjected to child labor and early marriages, making them easy targets for abuse, trafficking, and religious radicalization. Furthermore, the committee is concerned that children from Bengali, Bihari, and Rohingya communities remain stateless. The recommendation that the committee made to the government of Pakistan at the time in 2016, the committee recommends that the state party take all necessary measures to A, consider adopting a national refugee law in accordance with international standards and continue to host refugees especially families with children and unaccompanied children. B, ensure that all children born to refugees, including those who do not hold proof of registration cards, asylum seekers and stateless persons are registered um, at birth. C, integrate refugee and asylum seeking children into national and provincial education systems on equal terms with nationals of the state party. D, provide refugees, in particular families with children, with adequate housing and provide shelter to those who live in the streets. E, enforce legal measures against child and bonded labor involving refugee asylum seeking and stateless children. F, prevent and protect refugee asylum seeking and stateless children from falling victim to early marriage, abuse, trafficking, or religious radicalization. G, ensure the equal implementation of its citizenship laws with a view to extending citizenship to Bengali, Bihari, and Rohingya children. H, consider ratifying the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol, as well as the 1954 convention relating to the status of stateless persons and the 1961 convention on the reduction of statelessness. Now, I don't have time to read through all of the other committee's recommendations on the specific issue of Afghan refugees and migrants. Let me suffice it to say that Pakistan is entering the next phase of reporting obligations. 
Pakistan will be going to Geneva. They'll be sending a delegation to face the committees. The Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination will be reviewing Pakistan in August. At that time, Pakistan's delegation will have to respond to tough questions about the implementation of the previous 2016 recommendations. And there was one explicitly on the situation of Afghan refugees and migrants. After that, Pakistan will face another review, the one on ICCPR implementation. And again, there was an explicit recommendation about the situation of Afghan refugees and migrants in Pakistan. That is just the beginning. There are even more next year. Um, time's up, I've been informed, so I will sit down and allow others to, um, to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Again, a very, a very important list of suggestions coming from none other than the UN, it's UN itself. Recording in progress. So, um, I'm going to now just quickly uh, nip through the panel behind me and ask them if they have any further suggestions. I'm not uh, looking for speeches or uh, in, uh, good intentions, but for practical um, steps that people can take in order to improve the situation for uh, refugees. Um, so first, let me ask uh, Mehbooba. Is she there? Mehbooba Saraj? No. Um, well, Patricia Grossman, if I can ask her, does she have any further comments to make? I think she's gone as well. Um, Mudassir, the CEO of Sharp, do you have any further suggestions to make? I think everyone up here is exhausted at the moment. <laughs> But let me now turn to the audience. Ah, Patricia's there. Patricia, do you have any comments to make on what you've heard today? Is there, are there any practical suggestions that people can ta further take to improve the situation? Yes, yeah, sorry, um, the, the, we lost connection for a bit. So um, yes, well, I think we've made several, a number of recommendations that I think would be very good if both Pakistan and concerned countries um, should take, as I mentioned when I spoke before, um, paths to resettlement for those Afghans who are particularly at risk, um, those who um, are at risk because of um, their human rights work or as journalists or that might face reprisals if they return to Afghanistan. That's one, and that's where we haven't seen enough countries step forward to, to provide those kind of paths to, to, safe, to safety. Um, then on the economic front, we've made a number of, of recommendations too. You know, when the, the economy in Afghanistan went sort of over the cliff um, after the, the Taliban takeover because, of course, um, funding, much of the international development funding uh, was pulled out and that left the burden on humanitarian aid groups who simply cannot uh, provide, can, cannot fill that gap. They've said so to us explicitly and we we put out a report um, just in February about the healthcare crisis. And so there needs to be support for key areas, you know, things that are essential to livelihoods, income generating, such as electricity, water management, and so on, and public health. Um, that would uh, dr help address that. And of course, we you know, you know, keep calling for, as, as many Afghans do and everyone does with the Taliban to to end these terrible restrictions that prevent girls um, from going and women from going to school and university and so on. Um, but in the short term, since we don't see progress on that yet, is to address these uh, pathways to safety for Pakistan to stop these coercive um, sort of approaches to pushing uh, Afghans out, for others to step forward to find ways to provide support for Afghans, um, and to not forget Afghanistan. I mean, Afghanistan is now uh, a crisis for more than, you know, it's been 46 years since the war started. And of course, there are other crises, but this is one where many countries had a hand in and were deeply involved and are now having a kind of amnesia about it, and that shouldn't happen. They need to turn their attention back to how they can help Afghans um, get through this, this period of crisis. Thank you. Uh, I am back on, and if you want me to um, 
because I didn't hear you before. Uh, I do have some other suggestions if you if I can if I can talk about it right now. Will that be okay? Ah, yes. Okay. Please go ahead. Be brief. I, I will be brief. Uh, the one thing that I really want, uh, I, I think, is something that that the the government of the Pakistan, and not only of Pakistan, actually of the the people of the world, the governments of the world, not the people, the governments of the world, they should they should uh, get together and decide. Uh, what is it that they really want to do with Afghanistan? What is it? You as our neighbors, you know, Pakistanis as our neighbors, you have never been very very straightforward with the Afghans at all. We really don't know exactly what are your intentions about Afghanistan, and honestly. So every single time there is something happening, you do have a hand in it completely. I know that, and we all know that. The world knows that. But do you know that? Do you know as the people of Pakistan? Because, uh, you know, the talks in Pakistan also, out of the mouth of some of the people in there, are very different. Some people say one thing, some people say another thing, and it all depends how in, how much influence they do have in the government, you know, to change their minds. So, like, right now in the, in the United Nations, there was, a you know, a meeting that, was taking place, and Pakistan is the country that actually decided that uh, that Afghanistan uh, should should not should not go through with that um, you know with that decision, which was to you know to to get somebody um, as a as a you know that this was that that Turkish gentleman's you know um, uh, Mr. Farid's uh, um, uh, suggestion to Afghanistan, and I think Pakistan got involved in that, and and they didn't let it happen. So, so what is it? Are we, are we, uh, Afghanistan is a sovereign country? Are we not? Do we decide for ourselves? Don't we? And, and then, and then you, and Pakistan keeps on doing these things to us. Like, they close the border suddenly. And all of our goods stays on one side of the border and cannot get, get into Afghanistan. And that hurts us economically. And then suddenly you sent us, you know, hundreds of thousands of our refugees, which have become Pakistanis. And they have the Pakistan, you know, um, paperwork and everything. You send them across the border to us. So we really don't know. And not only you are doing that, our, all our neighbors are doing it. Iran is doing it. Russia is doing it. China is doing it. And the world is doing it. So, so we, as the people of Afghanistan, we are completely lost. We don't know what is happening. We really don't know. And at the same time, what is happening in Afghanistan, our, our, our personal security in this country is disappearing. I am talking to you right now on the on, on this program. I am not sure whether I will be still alive, all available, or free in the next 24 hours. I don't know. I've been living my life in Afghanistan like that. And not only me, everybody else is doing that. So, so this is, you know, the, the, the world needs a, an honesty, something that we really have to sit down and talk and find out where are we? What is it that we want? Because that's not that's not getting us any place. That's not getting us anywhere good. I can promise you that. It's really not. So tell us, that's something that you have to decide. We don't. We cannot. Not. Because in every step of the way that we go, Pakistan in one way or another stops in front of us. Everything. What is that game for us? I don't understand it. And I'm sure you do. Or people, people in Pakistan might, or maybe might not. I don't know. But the result of it in Afghanistan are terrible, terrible. I can tell you that much. Thank you. Thank you, Mehbooba. Again, another heartfelt statement by Mehbooba Jan. Um, I, I will just add to her and say that in all the uh, coverage of Afghanistan that I've been doing since 1979, uh, I can assure you that every single country in the region has interfered with Afghan aspirations, interfered with Afghan yes. needs and desires. And this interference, Pakistan is up there very much so, so is, as she said, so is Iran, Central Asia, Russia, all these countries have been interfering in Afghanistan. What is really needed is for countries to pull back and say, let the Afghans decide for themselves. Although many Afghans also want help in being able to devise a proper democratic system for the country. 
Thank you, Mehbuba. That is very, very, very much appreciated. Um, is there anyone behind me still no. who has something to say? So uh, let me reiterate. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Kaiser Afridi. I'm the spokesperson for UNHCR. So uh, let me reiterate one thing: that we should. Uh, let. Uh, so let me reiterate one thing: that we should. Um, we should keep this refugee issue, we should see it through a humanitarian lens, not as a political, from a political lens. And if a person is involved in any criminal activities or in any negative activities, this particular person should be tried. He sh the, the government should take action against this particular uh, individual. But the whole community should not be stereotyped, stigmatized, or generalized for this particular one person. So these people need our compassion, our kindness. If they return back, their life might be at risk. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Please stand up if you can. I, can, I should come there or it's okay? You can hear me from yeah. here? I just want to say for, uh, to Pakistan security establishment all, as well as the government and all the political parties, uh, for God's sake, Afghan refugees are human beings. Do not treat the, them as football. Do not kick them and take them whenever you want to and however you want to. Please deal this problem with humanity and keeping in mind that nobody leave their home with happiness. Everyone has right to be at their homes. There are people, Taliban's are murderers, Taliban's are the killers. How can we risk the lives of the, those individuals and communities, individuals who work on human rights, individuals who are working on culture, communities who are under th threat, like Hazaras in Afghanistan, do not send them back because Afghanistan has become a slaughterhouse for them and they are not sure when they cross the border whether they will reach their home or no. So please treat them as human on the ground of humanity. I'd like to turn to the audience now if there are questions directly for someone here up on the panel. Um, yeah. Is there a mic in the room? Is there a mic in the room? Right. Um, now, who, who's going to ask the first question? Yes, the lady in red. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Isha and I'm from Government College University, Lahore. My question is from Ms. Christina. Uh, that isn't it too much pressure or too much burdenizing uh, for Pakistan to deal with humanitarian issue uh, while we see that uh, USA left Afghanistan burning behind. And there are so many other countries like Turkey and Iran. They are also doing some repul uh, Afghan repulsion. And people are not uh, asking questions as, as they are asking questions to Pakistan. This is my question. And my suggestion uh, will be that if the international community make this happen in Afghanistan, they, then they will talk to the government over there that they have put the sanctions in Afghanistan. But they are not going to uh, go for like uh, negotiations with the Afghan Taliban. So this condition is making uh, the scenario over Afghanistan, in Afghanistan very worse. So I think that if the international community make this happen for like Afghan government to lose the sanction or to give them the uh, opportunity to trade with other countries so that their condition will be better and their refugees will go back to their countries 
and they can have a good and better life living with their self esteem thank you Um, to respond to that question, I think um, what I am speaking to is Pakistan's own national obligations. International human rights law is speaking to Pakistan, or not speaking back. These are Pakistan's own international human rights law obligations. The United States also has international law obligations. There are other states, of course, that are involved and need to be involved in the solution. And I think all of the um, treaty bodies have recognized Pakistan for its decades of hosting the Afghan community as well as other refugees. But what I was speaking to is still something, it's international human rights law. Pakistan has obligations. Other states have obligations, but that does not change the fact that Pakistan does have international human rights law obligations that it undertook voluntarily when it ratified these treaties. Um, and I do understand that there, there is dialogue here um, amongst different parties. There is a, um, a solution strategy for Afghan refugees group. Um, I know that there are efforts to find practical measures uh, to address this, this dire situation. Um, but when Pakistan's delegation goes to Geneva to interact with the uh, committees that oversee the implement implementation of these treaties, Pakistan will have to answer some very difficult questions about the measures it has taken to implement previous recommendations. I gave you one sample. That was just one sample. The Committee Against Torture has made recommendations. The Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. As I said, six um, of the seven committees that have reviewed Pakistan have all made recommendations that will help, um, I think, guide some of the policy making. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank, thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, just, just for those of us uh, who don't know, uh, Mr. Javed, you mentioned the four uh, waves of Afghan refugees coming into Pakistan. Could we have an idea of what proportion of those different waves are being sent back to Afghanistan? The, the fully settled ones or the ones who came post-2021? I think it would be helpful. Thank you very much. As the cancer have mentioned earlier, we have different categories of Khan refugees here in Pakistan. Number one, undocumented, newly arrived, PR card holders, ACC card holders. They are different categories. So that's why the first undocumented was in November, October. The government started this expulsion drive and where they sent nearly 500,000 people which were undocumented. But this is very confused philosophy of cons because they have uh, different categories among the families. One sister has PR card, one might have child doesn't have any card or a wife has a, a ACC card. So it's a family, uh, that expulsion affects a whole family reunification. That's number one. Secondly, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, numbers of Afghan refugees, the second category comes nowadays. There is a talk about expulsion of uh, these ACC, Afghan citizenship card holders. Uh, they were registered in 2017 after the government uh, uh, took one decision to register. There were, there were a couple of decisions of cabinet decision. Uh, there were registration of undocumented uh, refugees and the drive started in 2017-18 where they registered nearly 800,000. So this category as this time is being sent back. Uh, uh, two days ago, government of Pakistan allowed uh, three months extension to the PUR card holder. PUR card holders are the main category which can take benefits from all, they can access schools, they can access health services, they are most mandated and UNSCR mandated refugees in Pakistan. So it's very confusing. As I was talking about uh, the first wave, 
we had never ever had a authentic data of Afghan refugees. These numbers are on spec speculations and some categories. Uh, they never came to centers for registration just because they are scared they might get to registration center or get arrested. That's why the that's why the proper resource mobilization and resource allocation is not possible. And for the last regime who came nearly 700,000 people in Pakistan, all of a sudden there was Ukraine crisis and all the international priority and the resources were diverted to Ukraine. And there was flash floods in Pakistan. That's why government was so busy in handling the situation. Of course, in Pakistan, there was 3.5 million uh, uh, flood victims across Pakistan. And there were 700,000 Afghan refugees also affected in flood. And they are still waiting for their fate. So uh, we don't have any authentic data. Thus, we can't sit with the international community uh, to properly plan. Uh, uh, for their repatriation or resettlement or integration. That's very confused. And I really stress upon that we should have a reliable data and we should have a comes at least three to four years planning with the help of, with uh, international community or UN uh, uh, agencies so that we uh, plan their repatriation dig in a dignified manner. So thank you very much. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, don't, I don't recall that we have ever had such a serious and meaningful discussion on the issue of Afghan refugees in Pakistan. I hope we have uh, been able to present to you not just the plight and the situation of the refugees, but also solutions and possible practical steps that can be taken both from the Pakistan side and from the Afghan refugee side. Sir, there is one more question from my side and it is uh, for the, all of the panelists. Uh, yeah, so my yeah. question is that whenever we talk about Pak Afghan border, so there are always two sides. One uh, supporting the expulsion of refugees while the other su supports the retaining of Afghan refugees in Pakistan. But whenever we talk about Afghan, I have studied about this thing, whole thing, I have studied about this whole thing and came to note that Pakistani authorities and intelligence authorities have raised an issue where they are uh, uh, attaching this Afghan refugees issue with cross-border terrorism and smuggling issue. So they said that we, uh, Afghan, Afghanistan, yeah, Afghan refugees better treat this at a border between two countries rather than a line which they can pass easily. So what's your take on this? On the, sorry, on the cross-border? Uh, Pakistan authorities and agencies several times raised an issue that the refugees uh, which has passed continuously between two borders between Pakistan and Afghanistan have been linked to cross-border terrorism and smuggling. So what's your take on this? So as I uh, explained earlier that uh, if anyone is involved in any terrorist or criminal activities, the state, is, st state has the right to take action against that particular person rather than generalizing or uh, stereotyping or scapegoating or stigmatizing the whole community. So if someone is involved in any activity, the state should take action. And secondly, UN or UNHCR partners, uh, we as a SHAR, we only provide free legal aid and assistance to the people who are victims. Either they are victims or they are not involved in any even petty crimes. So that's our services and we don't appreciate such uh, uh, behavior so or I'm, these stereotyping I'm, as I'm well. I'm also in support of this thing, but I, I have compared this thing to US-Mexico border as well. Uh, can you listen to me now? Can you listen to me? Uh, sir, I have also compared this thing to the US-Mexico borderline. 
so uh, it's uh, re really much same like pakistan afghanistan border and us mexico border but us did same as well they have a very strict policy on mexicans so although i am although i am in support of retaining the afghan refugees in pakistan it is against the human rights uh can i respond to that i i'm not sure if i understood the question but uh, here as pakistani citizen as as a citizen of global world we definitely condemn all the illegal activities happening anywhere by anyone in the whole world talking about the afghan borders spin border and torkham border i have always talked about it that there should be a very transparent check and balance situation at the borders afghan borders on both sides there are many illegal things happening we all know that and the refugees who are going back let me tell you they are coming back by illegal ways and of course when there is no support by the forces it cannot happen and the refugees who came after post august 2021 all of them did not have their legal documents they gave bribe on our borders the women were sexually assaulted and abused and there are few cases of rape also on the borders so these all things are happening although sitting here talking about an ideal situation we can condemn it and of course as a lawful citizen we always go with the law but there is a need to have a holistic security and check and balance approach on the borders of course ladies and gentlemen um, i'm going to wind up now thank you very much for attending the session thank you very much for all your inputs and suggestions i thank the speakers also for um, being being so acceptable of the problems we've had with the microphone and other things Thank you very much all of you for coming.